thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. And thank you, Rebecca, uh, for inviting me to share what I am truly passionate about, which is your children and Montessori education and positive discipline. So thank you. So tonight I'm here to talk about healthy, respectful discipline for you and your child. Uh, and this is really what I have found to the combination of Montessori and positive discipline. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, so I founded Voila Montessori from when I was in the classroom. I was in the classroom with three to six year olds. And I realized that parents had many, many questions about what was going on in the environment. And the question that I got most often was, why is my child so different in your environment than they are at home? <laughs> right? And that's where I really kind of had that aha that you needed more information and you needed kind of that bridge of understanding what was going on in the classroom, but also understanding your child and how to nurture his, immense, his or her immense potential at home. And that's why I founded Vala Montessori. So I do parenting mentoring one-on-one uh, -on -one privately, also in small groups. I give talks. Uh, I also do a lot of home consultation where I really give my suggestions as to how to prepare the nursery for your newborn all the way through uh, six years of age. And um, most uh, what uh, was not mentioned was I've created and I host Be the Best Parent You Can Be, which is a yearly interview series that I do with um, world-renowned parenting experts in the field of, of psychology, discipline, sleep, nutrition, all of that. And I've, I'm very passionate about that. And I, the next one will be this October. So, and I think I'm going to focus purely on Montessori this time. So be on the lookout for that. And also uh, I co-host the Montessori Show, which is another opportunity for you to ask your questions. This is a monthly show that I do on YouTube with a colleague of mine uh, in Amsterdam from the Montessori Notebook. And we basically just chat, but really answer a lot of uh, questions that come from all over the world. So that has been really nice. And you can check that out on YouTube. Uh, the Montessori show. And then you can find me every Monday on my Facebook page where I answer your questions as well. So Montessori Mondays. So the child is truly a miraculous being and this should be felt deeply by the educator. And here I would like to say that you are the educator. You are the most important educator in your child's life, the parent being the first and the most important one. And I really you know, do all of this work really with this quote in my, in my head, in my heart, because I just truly believe that children are just these divine little beings, that we have the privilege of being with them, and we are here to guide them to, to be their, the best version of themselves. And so to do that, it is kind of important to understand human development. And that's what uh, Dr. Mar uh, Maria Montessori really helped us understand. For me, the Montessori method, what we call the Montessori method of education, is way, way more than just an educational method. It's, it's a way of life. It's a way of understanding human development and how we can assist it. When we say Montessori is an aid to life, it really is. It's about understanding um, the different needs of the child at different times of their lives. They go through different milestones and if we have that knowledge, we're better prepared, we're more confident, we, we know that we're making good decisions, that we have age-appropriate expectations and so forth. So tonight I'm not going to go too much into you know, the whole Montessori and human development, but I'm just going to touch on some very basic needs. So the, the six most basic needs before I go into uh, explaining more about positive discipline and how that can help you. So it is known that the child has really six very basic needs uh, from the time of birth beyond food and shelter. And love and security, as obvious as that may seem, is very, very important. This is, this is the, the, the pillar of their personality development, meaning that they are able to 
trust in the world. We always talk about two psychological legs that we, we stand firmly on. One is trust in the world, the other one is trust in ourselves. So that love and security is, is really very important from the time they're born, that, that their needs are being answered, that they feel that they're welcome, that, oh my gosh, this is a good place, I'm going to hang around, right? And we want that from the very beginning. The other one is movement. Movement is life. Movement starts at conception until our last breath. It is, it is what you know, makes us learn what we, when we go about doing our things. And, and movement, oftentimes, I feel that we get maybe a little annoyed by our children moving so much, right? They're in perpetual motion. <laughs> but it's, it's a need that they have. And so if we understand that, we can take a deep breath and go, OK, this is good, right? It's, it's part of, of their, their need. When we ask a child to, to sit still, I mean, it's, it's pure torture, right? And that's why you have these beautiful Montessori environments where they have the freedom of movement. Uh, thirdly is language. And when I say language, it's really about human interaction. It's really about looking into their eyes and letting them know that what they have to say is important and that you're there and you're listening whether you understand what they're trying to say or not, right? It's still fascinating. And, and giving them that, that uh, willingness to communicate and, and wanting to share their thoughts and their feelings is, is so important. Um, and you know, again, when I say language, it's really about the human interaction. It's not about um, listening to language tapes or watching uh, you know a show that's going to teach you the ABCs and everything it's really about them listening to our conversations having conversations with them telling them stories and, and um, I'll just say I often have parents tell me that they're bewildered because their children never tell them what they're doing during the day so for one children are, are beautiful teachers of living in the present moment. So when they're with you, they're with you. They've, that day has gone. They're, I'm right here with you. What do, what do you need me to remember what I did? And oftentimes, I know my daughter would tell me, I played, like, ah, oh, nothing. And that was it, right? But if you want that, if you want to have that conversation, share about your day. Tell them what you did. Who, who, who bothered you? Who made you laugh? Who, what, what kind of work did you do? Where did you go? Model that for them. And that will bring out that communication that parents are always so hungry for, uh, of, you know, my child never tells me what they're doing. Well, do you tell them what you're doing? So, you know, model, model what we want. Um, Fourth is independence. And when I say independence, it's really the need, and I think all of us here have this need of wanting to figure things out for ourselves, wanting to do things for ourselves. And children are no different from the time they're born. So it's not, because oftentimes I have parents, like they kind of cringe when I say independence as if it was, you know, I'm abandoning my child or something because they can do things for themselves. No, this is a basic human need. We want to do things for ourselves. And if you have toddlers, I think you've heard them say, let me do it, right? That's because it's a necessity. So I encourage, and that's what I do a lot with my home consultation, is really look at the environment from their perspective. Like, what can we do in our home environment to enable them to be more independent and to be able to do things for themselves. Because when we think of it in our adult um, environments, there's many obstacles that we have for our children. You know, we don't, we're, we're not always thinking from their terms. So sit down on the floor, see it from their, their perspective for their independence. The next one is order. And I'm sure if you are parents uh, of Montessori schools, you've probably heard a lot about order and you've noticed how orderly the environment is. And that's because it is a basic human need and it's also a sensitive period for the young child. And it's this notion that the external order brings internal order, where the child is trying to make sense of their world. They're trying to classify. They're trying to, to categorize everything. So if we have a big jumbled mess, 
it's, it's a lot more work. So it's not about, you know, we, we have to have it all orderly. It's just that sense of, of aesthetic and, and helping them make sense of their world. And when I say order, it's also routines. Routines are really very securing to the young child. They know what to expect. They can predict what's going to happen. And when, we, when I set up the room, the, the home, we often talk about like the different areas. And those are just points of reference so that we have from the very beginning, the child has a sense of what to expect in different areas. And, and that's just another you know, way of giving them order. And then lastly, firm and kind limits. And that's what I'm here to talk about, is this very important one, which is that children need and thrive on knowing what the boundaries are. Yes, they will test them and they will push them and see how far they can go, but they need them and they want them. They need that, that sense of security. And so discipline, um, and here Dr. Montessori again reminds us that let us remember that inner discipline is something to come and not something already present. Our task is to show the way to discipline. And we must remember that discipline here is not about getting children to do what we want them to do, right? It's more about the, the, the root of uh, you know, discipline really comes from the Latin word uh, disciplus, which is a disciple, which is really the teacher learning. Um, so this is where I'm coming from, is, is this notion of guiding the child to have the proper tools to, to navigate in their world. Um, and this is, you know, for me, it has been the whole positive discipline was something that... Um, that I discovered as I was in the Montessori classroom, and, and we were talking about Rebecca about this earlier, in, in our Montessori training we get a lot of beautiful training about the material, the didactic material, all of this, but sometimes there's those pieces missing of like, how do we manage these 25 little people? That's, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot and we need extra tools, and I found them in positive discipline, and, and so I'm going to share a lot of those uh, with you today. And I was lucky enough to be mentored by Jane Nelson, who is the author of all the uh, Positive Discipline books, who is a lovely 80-year-old woman now, living in San Diego with, I think she's probably up to 26 grandchildren and some great-grandchildren, so she's got a, a bit of experience, so <laughs> it's been nice. And I highly recommend, if ever in your area there is a positive discipline training, um, well worth it. It's, it brings a lot to our parenting toolbox. I know it did for me also as a parent of, um, at the time of two young ones. And uh, I often say that it saved my life because there were times when it was difficult to navigate, you know, this fact that I know they need boundaries, but at the same time you want to be respectful and you don't want to yell and, and all of this, and you just need tools of, of how to do it respectfully. So I like to start with sharing with you what positive discipline is not, so that we're clear and we know what I'm talking about, right? So first of all, it is not about punishment. A punishment often creates negative feelings, uh, and feelings of resentment where this is unfair, I can't trust the adults, or revenge where, you know, that the, they're, they're winning and uh, now I'll get even kind of thing, or maybe rebellion where ha, I'll get them next time, or, you know, I'll do whatever I want, or retreat, or the child just retreats back and doesn't want to, to deal. So being mindful of that, um, this is not about punishment. And uh, there's a quote from Jane Nelson that um, I really like, which is, she always says, where did we ever get the crazy idea that in order to make children do better, first we have to make them feel worse? Think of the last time you felt humiliated or treated unfairly. Did you feel like cooperating or doing better? 
So something to think about. Um, and then the next one, it's not about permissiveness either. Permissiveness is really the, the extreme. It's really kind of, oh, okay, do whatever, you know, I don't care. We, we, you know, it's kind of letting them loose. And permissiveness is, is only going to, um, how do you say, be, be overwhelming for the child. Because remember, they need boundaries. So if it's, it's, if it's a free-for-all, they need us to kind of guide them and give them those boundaries as to what is uh, acceptable to do. Uh, so it's just overwhelming. And then it's neither about rewards or praise. And this is a tough one for, for uh, many people because, you know, we think we're doing well by uh, giving stickers and, you know, high fives and good jobs and all of this. But it's not necessarily what the child needs to feel confident. We need to, to bring it back to them. And, and I'll talk more about that. Um, and it's neither about pampering. Pampering is, oh, it's okay, I'll do it for you, don't worry. Oh, your room's a mess, okay, well, you, you go off, I'll clean it for you. I mean, it's like, come on, let's be realistic here, right? It's not about that whole rescuing of, you know, the, the you forget something and then it's okay, I'll, I'll drive back 20 minutes to go get it for you. No, it's, we've, we've gotta be, gotta set the boundaries from the beginning. Um, and it's neither about punitive timeout, because I will talk about timeout in a different way, but the timeout of maybe a lot of you in this room, I know I was sent to my room to think about it. Like, okay, what am I going to think about? <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's what I mean about that punitive timeout is, is, the, is the timeout is a punishment. Like you're not you're not good enough to be you know, with us kind of thing. So uh, being mindful that that doesn't do much for their self-esteem and their confidence. And then lastly, this notion of taking away privileges. Um, and this, this, you know, I have a caveat for that because there are times when I have a teenager at home uh, there's certain things that, you know, if, if, I don't know, you know, if he messes up my car, well, he's not going to, I'm, I'm going to take that privilege away. But that's, that's a natural uh, thing that we've put in place together. Here, it's more about uh, if you don't eat your spinach tonight, we're not going to the park tomorrow. What's that got to do with it, right? So it's like, again, let's be realistic, like, let's, you know, which I think we do without, you know, without knowing. I mean, and I know that it was done to me as a child of, of, you know, being, you know, punished because I wasn't hungry. It's like, so being, me, being mindful of all of that. So that's what positive discipline is not about, okay? And now I'm going to get into what it is. So, um... Positive discipline is uh, based in Alderian psychology, which is Alfred Adler, who was actually a contemporary of uh, Dr. Montessori. And I did a little bit of research this summer because I was giving a talk on the same topic um, in, in Prague at the, the Montessori Congress and really wanted to figure out like, if, if, if they got to meet and unfortunately, they did meet uh, late in, in uh, Dr. Montessori's life, and she was only able to speak French to him. He was Austrian, so the communication didn't really happen. But to me, I just wish that they had been able to collaborate more because I feel that it is such a wonderful mixture of, of two you know, philosophies and approach to uh, being with children. So, and Rudolf Dreykus was also one that uh, worked on all of this. And it's really based in this notion that we all, all of us here and our children, everybody on this planet, all we want is significance and belonging. So when we know that and we can approach our children and discipline and such, and remembering <coughs> that all they're asking for is significance and belonging. 
then uh, you know we're, we're able to do better. And that the you know that behavior, the the you know misbehaving is our interpretation. Behavior always has a meaning. There's always something behind that. There's always something deeper. And I always like to remind parents that you know when children are having a difficult moment when they're you know having a tantrum or everything they're not giving you a hard time don't take it personally they're just having a hard time and if we can remember that and and be the adult in the room and and help them through these big emotions uh, i think we we are able to manage a lot better right so the five criteria of positive discipline uh, the, and these are great questions to ask yourselves too when you are in a moment of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, you know, which tool am I going to use here? Uh, ask yourself, is it firm and kind at the same time? And that's what positive discipline is all about. And firm meaning, is it respectful to the situation and to myself? to my needs as well, to whatever is going on? And is it kind because we want to respect the child? So it's really that balance. It's not the, 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 the punishment you know, from way over there, and it's not the permissiveness way over here. It's in the middle. It's, is it firm and kind at the same time? It's, I love you, and the answer is no, <laughs> right? And, and and is a magic word here, but. Um, Secondly, does it help the children feel a sense of belonging and significance? Because remember, that's what we're all based in. So really helping them have that sense of significance and belonging. And is it effective long term? Is this going to solve the problem right here and now? Or is it going to help the child in their journey of self-construction? Is it going to help them really uh, develop that immense potential? And does it teach valuable social and life skills? Which is very important, and, and we're going to do an exercise to, to uh, illustrate that a little bit more. And then lastly, does it invite children to find solutions? Because we want them to think for themselves, right? We want them to come up with, how can we do this better next time? And that's a very important question to ask them. So tonight, I'm going to share um, a few simple strategies. And know that these trainings uh, are two full days, or they can be five uh, weeks of you know one evening a week. I mean, they're, they're long. What I love about positive discipline, it's very um, experiential, where we really do a lot, a lot of role play where we feel it in our body, what it is to be a three-year-old that doesn't want to put their toys away and somebody, you know, standing over you and telling you, you have to. So things, and so that's why I say again, you know, I highly recommend if you're able to. So tonight I'm going to share really very briefly, uh, you know, some of these strategies. So um, the two lists are roadmap that I'll go over. Uh, do as I say the brain in the palm of the hand, asking versus telling, positive timeout, so I will talk about timeout, uh, take time for training and how to show, routine charts, and then the importance of hugs. So, so two list. Um, so two list is a very, it's, the exercise that I start any positive discipline training with, and I do a lot um, where I live, I'm in San Diego, I do a lot in the preschools of my area where I do these three week sessions. And I always start with this exercise of two lists and I've done this uh, all actually all over the world because I do some of it online. And this exercise is universal. You, the, the, the answers that come up are, are universal. So I've kind of prepared it for you, what it would be like, and if you wanna do this at home or with other people, it's really the idea of you're going to make first a list of all the challenges, all the 
<sighs> what the, these children, what are they doing? You know, that list, right? And I'm sure that you all have some similar ones that you could put on that list. And so having done this for over 10 years, it ends up being pretty much the same. And, you know, tell me if, if these also uh, speak to you. My child doesn't listen. They're hitting. They're having tantrums. Oh, they're whining. <laughs> they interrupt. They back talk. Bedtime routines. Oh my gosh. Don't get me started. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I got a slide for you. Don't worry. <laughs> and then um, they feel entitled. Uh, anybody? Is this okay? Yeah, we can go on this list. This is this is very universal, and the list goes on and on because when I do this, we take our time, and we, you know, there's there's a lot of them. But I took the major ones, and so after kind of dumping and really, you know, brainstorming on what all these challenges are, I want you to fast forward. Let's say. 18 years down the road and your child is now a young adult and they've come home for dinner and you've invited them and they're these beautiful young adults and you see in them these beautiful life skills and social skills that are really important to you and you're you're so happy because here they are they've they, they're, you're, you're proud of this young adult and you're, you're, you actually call them your child, but they're wonderful to be with and you actually want to hang out with them, which is, you know, which is saying a lot. So those life skills, think about that, like 20 years, you know, project that little child who is having the tantrum and whining and all this, what they might be like in the future and what would those life skills be? and write that list. And that's an important one to have. And here again, this one is pretty universal again. We want our children to feel confident, to be responsible, to be trustworthy, to be self-motivated, to have a good sense of humor, to be resilient, curious, and compassionate. And I'm sure you could add a lot more to that list, but Again, this is the ones that I've been hearing a lot. And so why this is so important for us is because we've got to be looking at the big picture. They are only three years old for a very limited time, but they will be adults for a long time. And this is our roadmap. This is where we want to help them get to. And what is important here too is always are we modeling all of this and this is a good reminder of what we need to model to them because they are watching our every move right that absorbent mind is picking up the good and the bad so be aware <laughs> and so this is you know and so throughout the the positive discipline training that we do whenever we finish an activity we always ask the participant what are you thinking feeling and deciding about yourself and we often ask is it helping you have these life skills and that's why i love this exercise because it gives us that roadmap of where we want to go and this list might be very different for each of you but think of it so that you have where you want to help your child get to, okay? Now another little uh, one that I like, and this I'm gonna need your participation. Um, so if you could place both hands on your knees, please. <sighs> Take a nice deep breath and exhale, and then just one of the hands, if you can make a circle with your index and thumb, kind of like an okay sign, and place that on your chin. I said chin. <laughs> <laughs> ha ha ha, I gotcha. 
do as I say, right? Which is oftentimes, again, this is the, the perfect example. And this, I trust me, do this at any dinner party. It works every single time, every single time. You get them every time. This is all about mirror neurons. This is about the fact that they are watching us and they will do as we do, not as we say. So if you scream across the room, quiet voice, it's not going to work, right? You have to walk over there. Could you use a quiet voice, please? So, and, and, and so on and so forth. But this one I love because a lot of you had it here. Sorry. I said gin. So this is, uh, this is a very important one. So that was fun. Okay, and the next one is one that um, I will invite you to, if you want more, um, how do you say, medical terms, scientific terms of the brain and the palm of the hand is, is a wonderful explanation of how our brain works that was developed by uh, Dan Siegel. And if you Google Dan Siegel, the brain in the palm of the hand, you have a, a nice YouTube video of him explaining it. But um, last summer for Be the Best Parent You Can Be, I had the honor of interviewing uh, Dr. Tina Payne Bryson, who is the co-author of The Whole Brain Child or No Drama Discipline, and just recently The Yes Brain that she co-authored with uh, Dan Siegel. And I asked her in the interview to explain the model of the brain of the palm of the hand to a young child. So if we can take just a minute to watch this video, um, I think you will, she will do a much better job of explaining it. If you don't mind sharing your explanation to maybe a three or four year old about the brain. I know I, I watch you uh, do the, the brain in the palm of the hand that I had seen uh, yep. Dan Siegel's video and, and, and learned it myself from Jane Nelson. But I, I really like your simplified version to be able to explain to a young child what is going yeah. on. And I think that that is so important to be able to again, take the child for an intelligent being that can understand right. what is going on. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to yeah. just show us that model, I think yeah. it would be really helpful. Yeah, and I helpful. love doing it because they are. They're amazing, amazing. I just uh, tweeted an article um, yesterday that I saw about how amazing, what amazing scientists these babies are. Um, and I think what's so great about this is it gives them a tool, even very young, to understand what's happening with their own brain when they get dysregulated. So um, this is uh, Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain that he has written about extensively and done videos on. Um, and we have a cartoon of it in The Whole Brain Child right. that you can mm -hmm. actually read to your child. Um, um, it's also in the workbook, the Whole Brain Child workbook. But um, I have the privilege of not only teaching this to my children when they were about three and four and five, um, but I get to go into preschool and kindergarten classrooms at my school and teach this as well. So here's basically, um, let me kind of explain what, what it is, and then I'll tell you how okay. I do it. So okay. basically, and you have to forgive my really bad manicure because um, no worries. it's summer, you know, and um, I'm a mom, so I don't have time to talk about self-care, right? Um, that's an indulgence. Yeah. Anyway, um, so and if, if you, you if you could just center it into, because the frame, exactly, right yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. So, so basically the idea is that we, we're going to, we're going to take our thumb across the palm of our hand and then curl our fingers around it. And actually the way this would sit in the brain is like right here. If we were being really accurate, there would be two of them because we have two sides to our brain, but we simplify it with just one. Okay. And the structures we're talking about are, so basically your eyes would be here. This would be the top of your head. This would be the back of your head. So basically we've got a brain stem that comes across the wrist and into the middle of the palm of the hand where like basically this finger right here is where our brain stem is. And and this is the fight, flight, freeze, very primitive, regulate sleep and wake cycles and breathing and all of that. It's fully developed at birth. The thumb area represents the limbic region. This is where your hippocampus, your memory centers, and your amygdala would be. Um, and this is um, mostly developed at birth, not fully, but mostly developed at birth. And it's where uh, that's known as the mammal brain. So motivation. Um, attachment, a lot of emotional centers are here, um, obviously the memory centers as well. 
And so Dan and I call both of these structures together the downstairs brain because they're built first and they're much more primitive, but that's not to say that they're unsophisticated. They're very sophisticated and, and we need them because they give us um, great instincts and, and help us act before thinking in, in times of emergency and safety. So they're really important. And then if you curl your fingers around, this is the cortex or the outer bark of the brain known as the neomammalian brain. So it's most developed in human beings. And there's one particular part that's essential. And it's basically the fingernail areas of your middle finger and your ring finger. So right here. And this part of the brain is called the middle prefrontal region. And it's the frontmost part of the frontal lobe. It would sit kind of back behind the orbits of our eyes um, and, and forehead here. Um, and this is the part of the brain that's the very last to develop, mid-20s. Now, you might notice anatomically it's part of the cortex. It's touching the limbic and the brain stem. So it's a really important part of integrating. And what this part of the brain does is a number of things, um, which is going to be the focus of our, our book, The Yes Brain. But it's about personal insight and um, empathy and morality and intuition and attuned communication and fear extinction and adaptive, flexible responsiveness, um, sound decision making, you know, all of the kind of core of social and emotional intelligence. Okay, so basically, here's how I explain it to little littles. So what I say to them is I will often start by saying, do you know what a model is? And they'll say, like Legos or a model airplane. And I say, that's right. It's not the real thing, but it's like a smaller version. Would you like a model that you could carry around in your pocket all the time, a model of your own brain? And they get excited about that. And here's what I do. I will say, okay, so I say, make a five, make a four, and then hug your thumb with your fingers. So that's how I get them into the brain model. And then I say, this part of your brain down here this is the part of your brain where you have really big feelings and you want to do stuff. And this part of your brain here, the higher part of your brain, this is the part of your brain where you can make calm, kind choices. And sometimes when your feelings get really big down here, it's like you flip your lid and it's really hard to make calm, kind choices. And then I will ask them, what do you do to hug your downstairs brain or your lower brain? What helps you calm down those really big feelings? And then we can talk about that. And they, they actually know what the science tells us, which is movement and hugging right. their mom or dad and taking deep breaths and, you know, things like that. We can teach them some other ways to calm their brains down. But it's really great. And, you know, when I taught my four-year-old this, I remember um, he had hit his brother. And I said, what happened, Ben? Why did you hit Luke? And he said, Mom... I just flipped my lid. Um, and then I, I had another time I was trying to get kids in the car seat and it was not going very well. And I remember Ben said, mom, you're not like this, but you're not like this either. You're about right here. And I'm afraid you're going to be a jack in the brain. You know? Why I wanted to share this with you, because this is really, again, it's, it's what we were talking about earlier is understanding human development. And if we can clearly explain to our children what's going on, why they're getting those big feelings, and how they can control them, and how we can also control them, because we're sometimes like this. I mean, a lot of the time, right? We get, I don't know, cut off on the road, or somebody talks to us, looks at us strange, or we get a you know, nasty email or whatever, we're gonna flip our lid. And remember this, the mirror neurons? Well, if two people are like this, do you think that they're gonna make any sense and come to any good, respectful, healthy, <laughs> you know, uh, solutions? No, so we need to find ways that we can go hug our thumb and we need to help our children also come back to a place. So if uh, teachers, I know there are some teachers in the classroom, this is a wonderful thing to teach our children uh, about and at home, uh, really wonderful because once they understand this, and also what I love about it is it can be kind of this nonverbal communication and, and it works with husbands and wives too. You can just go, it won't? Oh. <laughs> no, yeah, <I> fuck it. <laughs> because then you know that, okay, give me some time. I just need to regroup, right? And, and that's, it's just the way we work. And did you hear about the prefrontal cortex? Mid-20s, right? So when we talk about having expectations of what our children can handle, 
remember that. And it's some people say mid mid uh, 20, some people say 32. So it takes a while to be uh, complete. Okay. The next one is this idea of asking versus telling our children. Um, let's be honest. Do we mm, put on your shoes? Let's go. Put on your coat. Eat your dinner. Right? We're telling them constantly what we are doing, what they need to be doing. So let's ask some curiosity questions. Oh my gosh, what do we need to put on our feet before we put on our shoes? Or, I think it's kind of cold out. What, what do you need to put on your back so you're not cold? Asking them curiosity questions so that you can invite that cooperation and invite them to find their own solutions and to think for themselves. Because <clears throat> when we are constantly giving orders and telling them what to do, we're actually doing them a great disservice. Because after a while, they're just going to go, oh, I'll just wait to be told what to do. And they don't take that own initiative. Remember that basic human need of, of independence? We kind of take it away from them by always telling them what to do. So really, um, you know, being mindful of that. And again, this is, you know, this is a really long interactive exercise that we do where we have slips of paper and we, we really feel what it sounds like, um, but this is something for you to, I'm just hoping to plant a bunch of seeds that you can be thinking about uh, these things when you're interacting with children, whether they're your own children or uh, children that you deal with in the classroom. And yes, of course, very important, let them know what they can do. We're most often telling them what they cannot do we, we, we very systematically tell them to not run. Let's tell them to use their walking feet. They know about that. And they feel much more empowered when they're asked to show us what they can do, as opposed to us always just, you know, being no, 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 and kind of the, the police officer behind them, right? So be, be in a yes environment, and that's also, you know, a lot of what I talk about when I set up the home is like, we want to create an environment where they can do things and we're not also stressed about what they're going to get themselves into. And, and just be, be mindful that this is a very short period of time where you have to put that crystal bowl that your grandma gave you and put it up high so you're not going, oh, don't touch that right it's it's temporary it's 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 really a very finite time in their life so when they are exploring let's try to make an environment where they they can explore uh, freely and safely um, and now I wanted to talk about this positive timeout because I said no punitive timeout, but what about this positive timeout? And this is really about this notion, and this is something that we need to model to them as well. It's this idea that we need to learn to self-regulate, right? It's something that, that, we, that we, we don't come knowing all of it. And so the positive timeout is actually a space that you create together. So this is, an, I don't want you to go home and say, oh, I'm going to create a, a great positive timeout, right? This is something that you're going to do with your child. This is something that you're going to have really a conversation with and say, I've noticed that, uh, you know, sometimes there's some times in the day where you get really mad at your little brother and you just want to hit him. And, you know, I can't let you do that. I, my, my, my role is to keep you both safe. And so I want to maybe let's create a place that when you're feeling kind of upset and maybe you're starting to feel like this, maybe you're just like this and you're about to go like a place where you could go and just relax. What, what would that place be like? And have that conversation invite them to come up with the solutions of, uh, you know, what that place might be called. Please don't call it a positive timeout. I mean, <laughs> you know, have it space out or, or 
you know, iceberg, whatever they want, right? So that it's, it's their place. So they'll be happy to go there. And what's important here is in that conversation, really invite them to tune in to their bodies, to tune in to where is it in your body that you're feeling before you get mad? Like, what, are you getting a message? You know, our bodies are very, very intelligent. They're very smart. And sometimes they give us a signal and it could be a pit in your stomach. It could be you kind of feel like wiggling. I don't know. I mean, everybody feels differently, right? But help your child be aware of the messages that they're getting from that very intelligent, intuitive body so that we can invite them, offer this place when we're feeling this. So before we lash out, before we completely explode. And, and I've done this, um, I did this more in the actual classroom, in the primary classroom, and it's just amazing the, the language that they come up and this awareness that they have of what their body is telling them. So if we can help them kind of regain that, that intelligence that I think we've, we all need to tune into and, and <clears throat> as adults we do great work to go back to that and to you know uh, be a little bit smarter about things and in following our intuitions and such so this is this is really offering a place to kind of preventive right it's a place where when you're feeling that in your body well go there it's okay you can just say i, I need to go chill out in my dungeon or whatever you've called it right <laughs> and and you'll see it it's just wonderful and then the important thing <clears throat> here is that you model it so when you're upset you can say you know what i'm having a really hard time being in the same room as you right now i'm gonna go take three minutes and be okay with that you can leave the room if they are safe please go take a deep breath go go you know splash some cold water in your face whatever you need to do to calm yourself and be able to deal with this child's big emotion this child that hasn't learned how to self-regulate and all of that right because we're still the adult in the room so we need to to model that right I see these two looking at each other like, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and then um, another one that is to me very important is this notion of taking time for training. So when I say take time for training, like you're doing tonight, kudos to you because you're taking time to get a little bit more information, but it's also taking time to um, train your child you know we 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 can't expect them to know how to do everything they're they're new on this uh planet right they 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 need to be shown and and they need to be shown uh with respect so explain and show age appropriate ways of handling different situation at first you do it together you model it um, you take time to observe. Observation is, is, is a foundation to, to Montessori, the, the notion of observing our children with no expectation and no judgment and really seeing what we're seeing uh, without comparison, without comparing with the next door neighbor's kid or your you know, sister's kid, whatever. It's your child right there. They're unique. <clears throat> and then give them the opportunity to do it alone and give them the opportunity to practice and practice and practice and practice because remember repetition is very important and, and here you know one of the example I have for example you know we're rushing in the morning everybody needs to get their their socks and shoes on well if a child has never been shown how to put on socks how do you expect them to put them on right and don't wait until you you're you're limited on time to show them like give them the opportunity to, to practice these skills way before so that you have maybe a little basket with a few socks that they can practice for hours on end which they will do if you give them that opportunity 
so that in the morning when we're limited in time, we go, oh, remember how we did that? And then we can do it. So, uh, and that's an important one. And so here, I always like to uh, really remind um, families how to show, how to really show a child how to do things. And if you actually on YouTube, I have a, a YouTube channel called Voila Montessori, which I've done lots and lots and lots of videos showing, which is show is slow hands omit words, right? We tend to over explain everything. And we're blah, 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 when we're showing something with our hands. So where are the children looking instead of our hands? They're looking at our mouth because they're fascinated with language and they're, what, what, how, why are the lips moving that way, right? So when we want to show something, like if I were to you know, take this apart, I would take it apart. I'm, I'm going to show you how to take this apart. I don't know how to take it apart. <laughs> <laughs> and you do it, and then you can talk about it. But when you are in the action of doing something, please slow your movement so that they can really analyze and see what needs to be done. Slow your movements and don't talk. So slow hands omit words. Very important for, for any activity that you're really wanting to, to show them and teach them. Um, so routine charts, and this was for bedtime. You went, oh yes, tell me about it. So this is uh, routine charts. Again, this is something that I want you to do with your children. I do not want you to go buy the pre-made routine chart that's already done for you. This is something, let's personalize it. Let's have fun with this one, okay? So, and this one is something that I actually did in my home because I went through the uh, training and I think my son was around six or seven and oh my gosh getting out the door in the morning was hell because I had to get to work on time he had to get to school on time he's a big deep sleeper does not like to be hurried in the morning and we both started our days horribly because here I was screaming and rushing, I'm going to be late, okay, wow, where's your shoe? And I went through the positive discipline training and I learned how to do a routine chart. And it's really about, again, having a conversation with your child about, you know what, I've noticed that in the morning we're both like this and we're both starting our day with upset and screaming and I don't like to, to drop you off at school and I'm upset and everything. So let's figure out together how we can make our morning routine better or our bedtime routine or, or whatever. And this, please, only do it for that one routine that is, is causing havoc. Don't, don't have like multiple routine charts around the house. Like let's just focus on one so that they get used to, again, the, the system, system of it. And so again, it's asking your child to help you find solutions. So what I did and, and what I invite you to do is let's think, let's do something that's really fun. It's called brainstorming. That means that we think of all of the things that we need to do to be out of the house, fully dressed, well fed, with a smile on our face. What do we need to do? And we brainstorm and we, you know, we wake up and we put on clothes or we take a shower, brush our teeth, whatever you do, because every family does it differently. So you really brainstorm. And if they want to add in, go kiss the dog or the gerbil, whatever, you put that in too, right? You want to have fun. Like you really want this to be a, a brainstorming where we're, we're putting everything. And then, so you brainstorm together and then you're really asking, you know, how can I help? And we, I'm going to maybe remind them that maybe we put socks on or that we brush our teeth or, you know, they, they forget those things. So you just add on to that. And what you want to do here is be creative. So here, what I invite you to do, depending on where your child is 
in the acquisition of language or whether they're writing, reading and such. For the younger ones, you could do a role play where you take pictures of them doing all of these different things. And oh my gosh, they love doing that, right? They can ham it up and they're there with their toothbrush and putting on their socks or whatever. So you take pictures and then, you know, you can go to the drugstore, print them out and put them either you know, in a vertical line or in a little booklet or on a poster board, be creative, do what feels right to you. And for me, he was writing. So he must have been older than six. But anyways, he wrote each thing on a little post-it. So those little sticky ones. And he had them on his bedpost in a vertical line. And what was great was that he would move them around. But that was okay. As long as the last one was in the car at 8 a.m., fully dressed, eaten, you know, brushed his teeth. I didn't care if he brushed his teeth before putting on his socks. You know, I don't care. So that's, it's giving the child the ownership of their routine. And this is what's helpful as opposed to, you know, nagging them and reminding and everything. So it's really letting the routine chart be in charge. And you can just say, I don't know, why don't you go check? So you're really kind of off the hook. You're really letting it be in charge and you don't need to remind and nag anymore. And honestly, I mean, it, it sounds um, kind of silly and simple, but for me, it did a world of difference. Uh, and to this day, he is, he still has a hard time getting up in the morning, but he's very, <laughs> he's very organized and when he has, you know, a camping trip or a skating trip, he's, he knows what to do. So um, very important. So I, I would definitely encourage you if there's a routine and it works for bedtime too, where it can be bedtime. Sometimes it could be even a little book, but this is more for children who are maybe having time, uh, a hard time like sleeping and staying in bed and everything. You can create almost like a little sleep book of, of what the expectations are. And, and, and that's always nice. So being really personal about these routines is very, very helpful. And then lastly is this notion of hugs and more hugs. And I know that this might seem counterintuitive when a child is upset, but we need to connect <clears throat> before we can correct. Right. And actually, um, in that interview that, that you can, um, you know, find the entire interview of uh, Tina Payne Bryson was talking about, and it's in the whole brainchild, which I uh, highly recommend, is this notion that our, our emotional, so our right brain, right, when we get out of sorts, the child really needs help to reconnect with our own emotional brain before we can intervene with the, the left brain, which is more about, you know, the solutions and, and how are we going to make this better? It's the emotional side. So as much as that might seem counterintuitive to give a hug to a child who's literally driving you crazy, try it because it will actually calm you and it will calm them. So if you just say, oh my gosh, you look like you really could use a hug right now. Or you could even say, I really need a hug right now. And they might dismiss you and say, no, which is fine. You gotta respect them. And you just let them know, I'm here for you if you need one. And sure enough, within a few minutes, they'll be there and you can hug them and you can take those deep breaths, calm them down and then we can find the solutions and then we can talk about what was going on and how we can do better next time. So it's really that very important, that notion of connecting before we correct, because we tend to go, when we're like this, right, we tend to go into our, you know, how can you do this blah, 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 and, and, and try to fix the situation when they're not hearing us, they're not, they're not there. So don't, you know, don't waste your breath. Give some hugs and you'll feel better, they'll feel better, and then you can find uh, solutions. Um, so that is really the main tips. 
Positive Discipline has many, many. There's actually a deck of cards that you can buy with 52 of these solutions. It's actually an app now where you have the 52 Positive Discipline tools. So these were just, you know, eight of the main ones. Um, but I do want you to keep in mind that, um, you know, the behavior is always the tip of the iceberg. There's always so much more going on below the surface as to why they might <coughs> be reacting a certain way and that we're here to help support them. Um, and so some of the other things that we can do is always offer limited choices. And when I say limited, it's two, one, two, that's it. And choices that you are 100% okay with. No ifs and buts, no giving a choice and then going, ah, eh, not a good one. If you give a choice, you have got to stick to it. And if they choose that, they have got to stick to it too. Even if it wasn't maybe the best choice, they have to live with their disappointment too, right? That's how we're going to build the resiliency. Um, avoid lecturing as much as you can. Um, get down to their eye level. Very, very important to calm them down. Sometimes even getting down below their own eye level will actually bring the cortisol down and, and really calm them down. So really that notion of, of coming down to their eye level. Um, when we do the, the training, the positive discipline training, there's one where we're all up on our chairs and we have this person walking around looking at us. And it's true, you know, you, they look up to us in, in our nostrils and you know, we're, we're talking down to them. So really important to get down to their eye level uh, you'll get a lot more cooperation. Uh, encouragement versus praise. And this, um, you know, we talked briefly about it, but this idea of that we tend to give this praise of, that to me is a little empty of the, the good job and the high fives. It's, honestly, children aren't doing things to get the good job. They're doing it for themselves, for their own self-construction. So remind them of that. See that the effort, like, you know, talk about the effort. Oh my gosh, that looked like that was really hard to do. Wow, that must feel good to feel accomplished. That's it. Or, you know, just really talk about the process as opposed to just kind of brushing it off with, a, you know, oh great, okay, good. It's, it's really important. And, and what I love about encouragement too, in the word, encouragement there's courage which is to me the the kind of the best part of humanity when we're when we're courageous and when we do things because we're just called to uh, and encouragement is the I, the notion that we bring out the best in that other person and so that's what we want to do with our children is really help them bring out the best in themselves uh, remembering that mistakes are opportunities to learn, and that's true for your ch our children, but it's true for you too. Because, I mean, let's be honest, we make parenting mistakes mm, pretty regularly, right? But that's an opportunity for us to learn to be better parents. And, you know, don't, don't hit yourself for it. It's, that's part of it. That's, you know, we were, I always say, you know, we're, we're parents as, as old as our children are. We're learning to be parents with them. They're our teachers. So we learn. And when we make a mistake, please be okay with apologizing. Please be okay with admitting to your child that I made a mistake and I'm going to try to do better tomorrow or next time or whenever. It's okay. This is, again, modeling to them that mistakes are opportunities to learn and that we're we're human beings, we're not perfect, and uh, we're learning with them. And then try to limit screen time. I'm, I'm, I could give a whole lecture on this one, and <laughs> it's pretty much don't have any screen time. Uh, <laughs> but that, that will be for another day. And then please focus on solutions. And that's really uh, the most important thing. So that's what I have for you tonight. And um, I just want to, if you want to stay connected, I am um, on many social media as well as Montessori, so Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And if you are interested on my website, I have put a page for you 
Voila Montessori slash EN slash 21 PD tools, which is really a little ebook that I just prepared with you with a few more of these tools that could be helpful. Um, and um, that's it. And then I am open for any questions. I hope this made sense. Um, I know it, it, you know, it does to me because I've seen it work both in the classroom and at home and just, um, you know, doing these workshops for, for the last 10 years, I've just seen like the benefits that it has really uh, given parents and teachers. Um, so I very much encourage, um, and the, the books are all positive discipline and she has a whole slew, you know, some for preschoolers, some for teenagers, some for single parents. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So great resource. So how old can you start to do the discipline to the kid? So for me, it, to me, it, this is really an attitude that we're going to have vis-a-vis -vis discipline, right? It's really, again, about even with a newborn, like talking to them, letting them know what you're doing and such so that you get in the habit of finding solutions with your children. But this, I mean, this, this can start, you know, as, as toddlers, as soon as you see that there's, they, they need guidance, they need to be shown, you know, how to interact in, in society with other people, in social, uh, with other children, everything. So the earlier, the better, really. And it works throughout life because it, it now there's even positive discipline for relationships. So very important. <laughs> Anything else? So then um, at the taller age, you can, I actually did it with my kids and took pictures. And uh huh, uh huh, did great. That photograph, but um, they were a little older, so I was wondering at what age then? It does well, for me, this is, again, this is going to be, you know, I think a, a toddler who is starting to have like a regular routine. And you can do this, you know, even for just a routine. It doesn't necessarily have to be because you are in a situation where something is not going well. It can be from, you know, the beginning of, of helping a child ca kind of have a sequence of, of things when they're starting to have responsibilities of, of, you know, clearing the table and putting things in the dishwasher. Whatever that little routine you want to uh, put in place. So, yeah, but I don't know, two, 18 months, two. Yeah. If you have more than one kid, uh huh. Uh, then would you just focus on maybe one participating in what you're doing and then kind of hope that... So give me an example. The, the age of those two children and may, maybe an example that you're struggling with. Uh, they're week. both about 22 months. Okay twins okay and then so in the mornings um i don't know something like getting dry, uh let, let's say eating breakfast mm -hmm. um and then so it's i can i can wrap my head around okay you know we sit down and we you know are you done with your okay if you're done with your meal then the plate goes away it doesn't but then meanwhile if if i say one and the other one or this one's listening and then this one or or he's we're, we're engaging with each other and then this one just runs away then it's then there's two different issues because this guy is maybe right. just playing around right here, which is, you know, we're trying to eat breakfast, and this one is doing a whole other thing, like going to get another toy or, or just mm -hmm. leaving the room mm -hmm. entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So here, this would be, um, this I would bring in another tool, which is to me deciding beforehand what is going to happen. So really kind of sharing with them what your expectations are. And this is really a reminder. So maybe, you know, when they're waking up is, is that, you know, before we go to school in the morning, we have breakfast together. And what do we do? Oh, we have breakfast and we sit at the table. And what do we do afterwards? And so that it's kind of, you kind of sound like a broken record, but they need that repetition, right? They need to be reminded. And so if you're ahead of time, kind of anticipating ahead of time, what they need to be doing, and then deciding ahead of time also what happens if they don't follow that routine. So for example, 
And, you know, and if you walk away and go play with your toys, I'm going to put the breakfast away and there's no more breakfast, right? So you've decided ahead of time what you're going to do. You've shared it with them and make sure to follow through is the most important part so that it's not about running after him and going, oh, I'm going to put your breakfast away. Just do it. Just <laughs> let them and, 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 and put it away. So it's more about kind of following through and, and setting the expectations up ahead of time. If that makes sense. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Yes. Hi. So we have a three-year-old who still likes to be rocked. Okay. Bedtime Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Woo! <laughs> Dancing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she, so we're going to do the chart. The chart okay. We'll okay. With pictures and then we'll put it up. But the daddy rocking her to sleep and sometimes we have to pass out on the floor. How do you. So I think, again, that's a conversation you need to have with her of we're going to change this up a little bit. You know? And I think it might be difficult those first few nights, but. I think that that's a decision that you need to make as a family. And, you know, to me, this is, again, something that if it's something that you really want to change, this is a habit, right? This is a habit that has been perpetuated for the past three years. So like any habit, it takes time, it takes consistency, it takes determination. So it's an agreement that you and your husband first have to have. Are you on the same page about this one? Right? Because... <laughs> but, but no, right? Because... Crying it out? I'm not a crazy one about crying it out. So let's maybe... Let's, let's put a timer for how long we rock. And, you know, or, or come up with something. And I, as a three-year-old, she's got a lot of solutions. So as a she or he? She, she has a lot of solutions and just let her know that, you know, we're going to try something different. And I know you really love daddy to rock you, but you know what? Daddy wants to be doing something else and he wants to go, you know, just go read his book or whatever, you know, doesn't want to fall asleep and take two hours. So that, or, you know, Worst comes to worst, I would definitely work with a sleep consultant and because that's, that's what they really, really focus on because it's really about breaking a habit that we've, we've created. And, and as much as it felt so nice when they were newborns, she must be getting pretty heavy, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So maybe find another way. Say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sit on your bed. And, and hold your hand for a little bit. Like, find other ways to satisfy that need for connection because that's, that's what she wants, right, is that connection. So don't, like, you know, go cold turkey, but work with her of, you know what, we're going to try to get away from this. Um, and this is where maybe more of a little sleep book might be, like the story of what sleep is and, and kind of, you know, find a new simple, simple is the magic word, simple routine that you can replace this with maybe you know it's a song maybe it's a maybe we dance a little bit before so we're still connected we still have movement and then we go to bed you know whatever like be creative but yeah hmm. that's a tough one yeah but it's like it's like you know it's like everything it's it's that idea of these are habits that we have created and you know out of the goodness of our heart because we want to, you know, please and love and all of this. But when it gets to that point where it's like, okay, now what do I do? You know, so yeah. Uh-huh. Anything else? Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask her with the response she had to the last question, if those are the same guidelines with uh, your child to sleep in her own bed. Because yes. she was good for two and a half years in her crib. But mm -hmm. I, the day we took the crib down, we ran to our bed. Mm -hmm. and well, imagine for two years you were confined in a box. Yeah. And then suddenly you have freedom. <laughs> right? So you're going to go for it. So this is her bedtime story. This is her bedtime story. You have a beautiful bed. If you get up tonight and come into daddy's and mommy's room, daddy and mommy are going to walk you back. 
but you two need to be awake to walk her back, right? And not say, oh, come on, you can cuddle with us, right? You have to be okay and make a decision of what your boundaries are. Some people are fine with their children coming in in the middle of the night and finishing the night there. Some others are not. So you have to decide what your boundaries are and be very clear and matter of fact about it. And it's going to take a few nights and you might be feeling a little sleep deprived that first week, but it's worth it. And what I would uh, suggest is if you're already feeling a little sleep deprived, make sure your sleep tank is full before you start implementing something. So if that means, you know, for the next few days, just, you know, have her sleep with you because you're, you're, you're at least you're sleeping. And then when you decide, you have a conversation with her and say, you know what, it's in, now it's time for you to finish your night in your room and you, you can come and cuddle with mommy and daddy when it's light out, when the sun comes up or, you know, when there's a green light or, or whatever you have. But those are the expectations. And if she gets up in the middle of the night, you have to walk her back without a word, without, you know, the glass of milk and the this and the that. Just very simple. And let her know, again, it's, you, you're letting her know ahead of time what you're going to do, and then you follow through. And no ifs and buts about it. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear more about positive timeouts and how they contrast to conventional ones. So uh, the contrast is in the word positive and that we are, we are using this as a preventive uh, method. So we're, we're helping the child self-regulate before. We're remembering, we're helping the child identify what they're feeling and what might make them uncomfortable and invite them to go take a moment to themselves to regroup so that they're not going to blow up. Contrary to what you know, we might have all have experienced, which was the punitive timeout, which is you've been bad, go to your room and think about it, which doesn't really help remember that first that that list of life skills it doesn't really engage uh, confidence and trustworthiness and, and all of that it just kind of makes you feel bad and makes you think about how terrible you are as opposed to finding solutions of how we can resolve these problems and how we can be better next time so that would be the big Big, big difference. Yes, back there. Um, when you have a situation that occurs um, with a young child and it's, whether it's hitting or something that's a, a severe type situation, I know remaining calm is always, Yes. You know, to, you know, how do you get them, because they don't understand, like my son is two years old mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. so they don't understand, I guess, the reaction to another party from their from their action so how do we get them to understand like this is going to cause a big reaction with someone else so do you understand what i'm saying uh, yes like but, i don't I want mean, to come across if, as being if, if for, for one you know and i'm not saying like let your child be you know get beat up but <laughs> you know but but they they are quickly going to understand the cause and effect you know right. if 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 i hit my friend my friend's going to hit back and such right the, you can't explain that to them not not at 2 year they don't have that reasoning mind yet right but at what point do i guess what is the best way to approach when those situations happen you know at an early age you know, I don't want to, oh, I'm not going to overreact, mm -hmm. but how can I get him earlier to recognize this is really bad, not just kind of... So it's in the language that we use and in the firmness. So it's really, again, going up to him, getting down to his level, holding on to him and say, I, so you're, you're I, you're the one that's in, in charge. I cannot let you do that. I need to make, make sure everybody's safe and I cannot let you hit people. So you're in control, you're calm, you're in control, you're, you're guiding him. 
and you're, you're loving, but you're firm, right? It's that kind and firm where you're, you're still saying, I'm here for you, and I can't let you do that. I have to keep, you know, your brother or your cousin or your neighbor safe, and, and, and that's it. So it's really, and try, you know, as much as possible, be observant at maybe what time of days, is, the, is there a low blood sugar going on? Is there uh, towards, you know, a part of the day where he's really tired? So if we know those things maybe ahead of time too, we can guide them to maybe their positive timeout place or to go do something separately, alone, things like that. So if we're observant as to, you know, when this might bubble up, also we're able to guide them and, and avoid those situations. But yes, the, the firmness is important. Anything else? Yes? Would that go along with dogs? As Positive dogs? time out for the, oh, for. I don't know what he was saying, the problem where I feel like she's a little abusive with our two little dogs and mm. she thinks that they're her brothers and sisters, but they're not. Mm -hmm. She'll act like a dog sometimes. Mm -hmm. But she pulls on them constantly. And I'm, I feel like I'm always telling her no, no, no. But how do so, I redirect? So, so, so I try to redirect that with, okay, go play with your toys. We'll do this. But it's, or, it's or, always or, the well. issue where the dog and my dogs live in fear. It feels so bad. I sit there and they come running to me and they're like, or they hide or, you know, I'll find my little one so, up in her cage. So what are things that she could do with her dogs? Does she take care of them? Does she feed them? Does she give them yeah, water? Yeah, I let her feed them. So, not so the water, she'll so, spill it, but we go for walks. Okay, so, so maybe in those moments where, where you're fearing for the dog, you know, being abused, maybe ask, like, can you show me, can you show me how we give her a nice pet or rub or, you know, remember it's, and that's what show she'll me do. what she can do. And she'll look at her, I'm like, Mia, and she'll be like, pet, pet, pet. And then I'll turn around and she's like, I'm like, uh, so she understands, but she's still. But she's testing the boundaries. Yeah. So it's just a reminder. And again, you know, stand up and have those boundaries. I can't let you do that. But again, it's I can't, right? It's not you can't. Because a child, when you tell them you can't, they just look at you and go, huh, I just did. What are you telling me I can't, <laughs> right? So like, it's, it's really sometimes in the language of how we say it, of, of I'm in charge here. And I love you, and I can't let you do that. Right? Because when, when, when she's hitting the dog and you say, no, you can't do that, I'm doing it. What are you telling me I can't do it, right? So it's, it's, it's oftentimes in, is how we communicate that, those boundaries. Because they're, they're, I mean, that's what they're here for, right, is to test us. So they do a good job at it. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes. So the question is, uh, when you're the only adult around and there is a physical interaction between two children, do you have recommendations for which child to talk to first? The one who hurt another child or the one who was hurt? Oof, that's a tough one. <laughs> because I would tend to, you know, to go towards the hurt and say, are you okay? And then really helping the child who hurt learn about the, the compassion of let's go see do you think you know do you want to ask him if he needs an ice pack or 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 something so that there is you know we need to tend to the child who's been hurt of course um and then and then you know focus on, on them almost you know kind of burying the, the you know making a barrier and and tending to that one and then turning to the other one and go you know, do you, do you want to help me get something for them? And here, again, though, once they have calmed down and, and you know, once they've, they've connected here, again, it's important to put them both in the same bucket. So to really, you know, especially if, if it is sibling rivalry, is really about, I trust that you two can figure this out. I trust that you two can figure out how to play with this toy 
together? What, what solutions do you have? You know, really engaging them in finding the solutions as opposed to what we tend to do is go in there and be the arbitrator and be the police and you know, you go to your room, you do this, you do that. It's like, no, they need to, to figure that one out. So I hope that was helpful, yes. Good, well, I'm glad. I hope this was helpful. I hope that it's a, just a little seed for you to explore more and to be, to be thinking of how we model, right? And, 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 and you know, how our brain works and everything and that, that uh, your children are, are wonderful and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.